We're going to continue where we left off last time, now sections 2, 2 to 2, 7. That's in your textbook. And uh, what, are, what is it that we are uh, going to talk about? First, last time I showed you how you can locate the satellite within an orbit. Right? If, if you know the, locate, the, the orbit, first of all, we saw that the solution of the differential equation that it is, describes the satellite motion is elliptical one. And then if you know uh, satellite position at one time, let's say when it goes to perigee, and you're looking any other time by using uh, the, the methodology that I showed you last time, you can, you can uh, uh, determine the position of the satellite in that orbit, in the coordinate system that has x, y plane being the same as the orbital plane and then z axis that comes out of the orbit. But that's not... Uh, very useful because what happens every satellite has its own orbital plane right so there if you were to do this then that would mean that for every one of the satellites you would have its own coordinate system and what we really want to know is the location of the satellite relative to some uh, universally accepted coordinate system and the most logical system is to uh, to, to adopt is the same one we use for terrestrial stuff, right? The latitude and longitude and, and altitude, right? Can we locate a satellite if I'm here? Where should I look in the sky to find that satellite? Because that's how we communicate. We put the antenna that points at a certain part in the sky. So what we're going to do today is we're going to go through a two-step process. First, we're going to define what is called geocentric coordinate system, fixed coordinate system, the one that is, has the Earth of, as the center of the universe, and then, then uh, we'll, we'll determine the position of the satellite in that coordinate system. That system is used universally in astronomy to map the sky, right? So based on that system, we can say this star or whatever, this uh, cosmic object is in this location. And then once we uh, show how you locate the, the satellite in that universal coordinate system, we're going to find out how do you locate a satellite relative to the rotating coordinate system that we that we live on, right? That uh, that is kind of having uh, us in uh, on the rotating Earth. And then uh, I'm going to complete this by going through a detailed example of these calculations, and I'll talk about some supplementary material that I'm going to put on the website uh, so that it helps you with uh, with these calculations. So the first thing that uh, we're going to go is, is look at what is called geocentric equatorial coordinate system. Generally speaking, let me just look at the, the next slide. Generally speaking, if you, if you remember the equation, differential equation that we used to uh, at the very beginning, it was a second order differential equation of the vector, right? The vector which was the radius vector that goes from the center of the Earth to the satellite. Second order differential equation of a vector has six constants that once you, once you integrate, uh, you will have to specify. If you, if you uh, just look at it from a mathematical standpoint, if you have a, a second order differential equation of a vector, this would give you infinitely many solutions that satisfy those, uh, that differential equation. To go from infinitely many solutions to a particular orbit of a satellite, you have to have six initial conditions or six constraints that you put on this differential equation. And generally speaking, we're going to need six parameters to describe the location of the satellite. We said within, a, within its orbit, we're going to give the time where the satellite goes to perigee, and we're going to give the radius vector in the, in the plane that specifies the orbit. Right? So there are two x and y coordinates in the plane plus the time where it goes to the point where it's closest to the Earth. We already deal with those three. Now, the three additional that you need is to kind of tell, uh, to explain how is this orbit positioned relative to the Earth, right? Because you can have orbit position, uh, position any, any arbitrary way. So in, a, in a, I guess, practice, we use these three coordinates. Uh, first, we, first of all, we describe something that's called geocentric equatorial coordinate system. That's a coordinate system that has a Earth as a center. The z-axis goes through the through the axis of rotation, right? So it's it goes through the North Pole, 
And then the x-axis points with something that's called first point of areas. This is a very distant star. So what that means, even though the Earth is rotating around the Sun, these rotations are so small that for all practical purposes, this x-axis points into a fixed, uh, fixed direction in space. So you have a coordinate system that sits still right, in the, in the universe. And then relative to this, to this coordinate system, we specify the orbit through uh, three parameters. First, we specify this i, which is the inclination of the orbit relative to the equator. So if you think about the equator as being horizontal plane, the orbit can be any angle relative to this plane, right? If it sits in a plane, what's the inclination of the time? Zero. 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 If it sits like this, what's the inclination? 90, 90, 90 degrees. degrees. So anywhere between zero and 90 is what the, the plane where the orbit resides can be, can, be, uh, uh, can be located. Now, if you think about it, you can have infinitely many planes that are at the same inclination, right? So the second parameter that we use is this parameter omega, which, which, which is capital omega, which is called right ascension. It's the, if you think about now orbit, it tells you at what angle relative to this x-axis is the place where the satellite comes out of the uh, equatorial plane, right? So think about a plane that's uh, inclined like this, and then satellite goes like this through that, in that plane. So at some point, that satellite is going to cross the equator, right? And then if you look at the angle between the x-axis, which is the fixed axis to that distant star, and the, and the point where it crosses the equatorial plane, that's what we call uh, ascension angle, right? Right ascension angle, right? So that's the, that's the second parameter that we need. And then the third parameter is, now you actually specify the, the plane and uh, the, the point where the, uh, the, you selected one of those potential planes that have the same inclination. So you specify the plane, but you still need to explain where is the perigee, where is that reference point. So at that point you say, okay, what is the angle between this point and, uh, and the perigee? That's the third parameter. So we have three parameters that we use to specify the, the orbit relative to this coordinate system. It is going to be the inclination of this plane, it is going to be the point of uh, right ascension and then the argument of the perigee, where, where is the, the, the um, satellite closest to the Earth. Okay? Now, there are very many satellites and it's, it's not easy to keep, uh, uh, I guess, track of all of these. And fortunately, there is this database for all the satellites that we have currently uh, flying in the sky, and their orbital parameters are provided at this website. You can go to this website here, and uh, this is the one maintained by NORAD and NASA, and it gives you uh, the orbital parameters for all the satellites that are, that are currently flying uh, uh, in, in the sky, flying around the Earth. Now, this is, these parameters are given in what is called TLE. TLE stands for two-line, two-line, uh, I forgot what A, TLE. Uh, two-line element, two-line element data. Yeah. And this is how this two-line element data looks like. If you go to this website and, and look at any particular satellite, it will give you a whole bunch of numbers. And here, what you have on the slide, is how you interpret these those those numbers, right? TLE data are measured data, right? This is the measurement position of the satellite, and these measurements are performed very often, depending on the orbit of the satellite, depending on, on, on uh, uh, I guess, how much these orbital elements change. These these two line element data are updated all the time. So, for example, let's just look at this one here. What I have here given is the two-line element data for International Space Station, right? The, the code is Z-A-R-Y-A. Uh, this is International Space Station, and this is the two-line element data. You have two lines, and then you have a whole bunch of administrative uh, uh, parameters, but also you have a whole bunch of, uh, you have these six parameters that we use to describe the position of, this, of the orbit and then the position of the satellite. So they're mostly in the second line. Or let, let me first go to the first one. The important parameter is this one here. 
this, uh, you say it here, 08264517 and so on. The, the, the first, let me just make sure that I'm not telling you, the first two numbers here are giving you the year. So this, this particular uh, two-line data were retrieved in 2008. The second, uh, the, what follows here is what day of the 2008. So this is 264.5 and so on, day of the 2008, right? When this was measured. At that point, when these measurements were done, this is where the satellite was. And then you can look at mostly a second line, and you can see, for example, this parameter here, uh, 51, that's the, uh, th this is, I guess, the second line, the, the satellite number. This 51.64, that's an, uh, that's an inclination, right? This is that first parameter, how inclined the orbit of the, of the uh, International Space Station was. The next field here is the right ascension angle, this capital omega. Then uh, it kind of goes a little bit, uh, then the sixth field, so one, two, three, four, five, six, that 130.5360, that's a, that's a argument of the page. So those are, those are the three parameters that gives me the location of the orbit. Now, how do I locate the satellite in the orbit? Well, I'm given the eccentricity of the orbit, which is this one here. Then we're given as a mean anomaly. I'll show you how you actually calculate the perigee from mean anomaly, the time of the perigee you can calculate from the mean anomaly, and then mean motion, which allows you to calculate the, either the period, and but since we know that the period is linked to the, uh, to the semi-major axis, this parameter allows you to calculate the semi-major axis. So you have semi-major axis here, you have time at the perigee here, and eccentricity that allows you to calculate the position of the satellite within the orbit, and then you have the uh, inclination, right ascension, and argument of the perigee that allows you to calculate the position of the orbit relative to the, to the globe, relative to the fixed ge geocentric satellite system. You have other, other parameters you can find here. Uh, some of them are just uh, numbering, like for example, satellite number, whether it's classified or unclassified and so on. But there are some other ones that uh, allows you, for example, to calculate uh, uh, the drag on a satellite allows you to calculate uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot of other parameters that, uh, that characterize the orbit of the satellite. This data is, uh, what, what we're going to do today is I'm going to kind of go through calculations. You will see how they work and they're going to be like a first order approximation of where the satellite is going to be. Uh, these data are filled into something that's called propagator, right? Propagator in satellite terminology is a software tool that allows you to calculate or to do orbital mechanics and predict the position of the satellite. And there are several uh, of these propagators. You can get to NASA site. They actually have a MATLAB version of the propagator that do all of these calculations in, uh, in great detail. Now, what uh, we're going to do, we're just going to use a simple propagator, just assuming that it's the satellite and the, and the Earth and treating both of them as, uh, treating Earth as a, as a perfectly spherical, uh, you know, uniformly distributed mass. Uh, that's that's going to give us a good estimate for what we're trying to do. And what I'm shooting for is really for you to get a feel how, how this works. But there are other propagators that take so much more into account. They take, for example, the influence of the moon, the influence of the sun, the influence of the Earth being not perfectly round and not perfectly uniform in terms of its mass, so all of that. And even with them, with all, taking all of these into account, there are still, uh, uh, I guess, so far that you can get analytically. And what has happened, I don't recall exactly, but maybe last year, uh, uh, there was there's some satellites that actually go around the Earth for specific purpose to map, uh, map its uh, gravitational field. And what that does is instead of doing analytically, actually you have you have the exact model so you can predict the, the motion of the satellite with the great accuracy. So uh, the the punchline here is if you go to this website you can you can find uh, the uh, orbital elements for every one of the of the 
six satellites that are in the orbit. Now, relative to this uh, fixed system, we are not on a we are not on a on a fixed on a I guess motionless Earth. The Earth rotates, so if you think about it, uh, there is the z-axis that stays, but our natural field for what x and y is it rotates around. We're not when I look at straight up, fortunately like when I look at towards the equator, I'm not always looking to the same star. I'm always looking you know at a different place of the sky. So based on that we define what is called rotating rectangular system, which is the system that uh, that uh, is kind of derived from this geocentric fixed system. It uh, has the same z-axis, right? The z-axis is the same. X and y are, are now in a equatorial plane, but x goes uh, through the zero, zero, zero latitude, zero longitude point, and then it kind of rotates, you know, over 24 hours period. So over 24 hour period, it would make a full rotation, right? And it aligns with this uh, geocentric system once a day, but at a different time. Right? So, uh, so we need to actually figure out how to express the satellite location now in terms of, of these new coordinates, x, r, and y, y, because if I'm located somewhere on the Earth, this will give me the position of the satellite that I can pinpoint by knowing where I am on the Earth, right? because it's referencing the same, uh, same coordinate system. In this system here, x, r, y, r, z, if I'm sitting still on the ground, I'm, I'm uh, sitting still in this coordinate system, right? So that becomes my reference point, and then if I know the position of the satellite in this system, I can say point to this location in space, and that's where the satellite is going to be, right? So how do we uh, uh, find uh, the location in this new system? Well, it's simply through a rotational transformation, right? This, this system is going to be, as I said, the z-axis is going to be the same, and there will always be I'm going to be angle of the rotation between the, the geocentric uh, fixed system and this geocentric ro rotation system. So what I really need to understand is how much this uh, rotating system is rotated relative to the fixed one. What is the angle between these two systems? What's the angle between these two x axes? And the way how we do that we know the rotation of the Earth. We know the angular rotation of the Earth. And what we really need to, the only thing that we need to understand is, I guess, what time it is now, and when was the last time that these C2 guys were aligned. And then by knowing what the rotation of the Earth is, I can estimate how far these two systems move from one another. Uh, this is 72 microradians per second. This is the rotation of the, of the Earth. If you multiply that by, by the number of seconds in a day, you're going to get 360 degrees or 2 pi radians. So how do we uh, map between these two systems? Let's say, uh, let's say we know the position of the satellite in its orbit. Right? So this is x0, y0, z0. z0 is always going to be 0, right? Because within respect to the orbital plane, you're always in the orbital plane. Now, this is a mapping matrix here. Uh, omega, uh, capital omega, is the right accession. Uh, lowercase omega is the argument of perigee. And then i is the inclination of your orbit. Those are the parameters that you get straight from the two-line element data, right? Those are. And this is a mapping matrix. Let me uh, make sure that I point this, and, and this is going to be right on record. This matrix is, is incorrect in your book, right? And uh, I went through a lot of pain trying to make things, calculations work. And then finally I went to the original reference, and then I found, I think this cosine here in your book is sine, and there's some other uh, flipping of the, of the of, this, of the sines and cosines, and I think one of the sines is flipped. So make sure you double check and then correct it, right? So if you're gonna, if you use it for calculations, be aware to double check the, the, the book. Now, 
What this does, this mapping matrix, I call it M1, and the arguments are capital omega, omega, and I. If I feed my position of the satellite in the orbit, it will give me the position of the satellite x, y, and z relative to the fixed coordinate system, right? So this performs the translation from the orbit to the fixed coordinate system if I know the parameters of the orbit. Parameters of the orbit being capital omega, lowercase omega, and i, right? So this is a linear transformation transforming coordinates of the orbit to the coordinates of the fixed, fixed coordinate system. Now, if I know now coordinates of the fixed coordinate system, x, i, y, i, and z, i, then to translate that into the coordinates of the rotating coordinate system, I have to do this transformation here. This is a rotational transformation. You can see this is pure rotation, right? z is not going to change. z, r is equal to z, i. But x and y will change depending on this angle, omega e, t e. Omega e is the angular velocity of the Earth, right? And t e is the time that elapsed since these two coordinate systems were aligned. If these two, co if if I happen to have to look for the position where these two align, then this is zero, right? And then this is one, one, one. This becomes identity matrix. But then if uh, if I let the time elapse, then this would kind of rotate and then you would kind of be able to determine the position of your satellite in this rotating coordinate system. So therefore, you know, both of these are linear transformations. So if you transform once and transform the other, you can actually transform with the product of these two matrices, where you first transform relative to the orbit and then you transform relative to the to the rotation of the coordinate system, uh, the rotating relative to the fixed. This is not commutative, so you cannot do uh, M2 first and then and, and one second. You have to do it in this particular order, right? So what this so this is the complete complete mapping from the orbital system into into the uh, rotating system. The only thing that is left is how do I determine this angle omega e t e omega e I know that's uh, that's the angular velocity of the Earth, but how do I determine the time where these two were completely aligned? When were these two systems aligned? Because it happens, uh, it happens at different times all the time, because the rotation is not exactly 24 hours. We'll see later, it's 23 hours, 56 and 4.09 seconds. So, you know, how do I determine how much time has passed since these two coordinate systems were per perfectly aligned? And that, uh, to do that, you actually uh, fo follow the, the, these calculations here. Uh, you would determine this angle omega t e as using this uh, equation here, where t is time in the minutes after universal time midnight. Universal time is the time that uh, is measured at the Greenwich meridian. Right, it is five hours earlier than here. Like, if you want to, that's that UTC time. And then uh, these are some very ugly equations. The important thing here is this TC. TC is uh, the time in what is called Julian centuries. Julian century is they reference this date, 1899, 30, December 31st, as a start. Right. And this is called Julian Day 245020. And then using this, uh, uh, this, uh, this formula here, you can calculate Tc. Then you calculate alpha g. Then you plug in the time at which you are doing the calculations. And this will give you this angle here. Right? Now, this is a lot of astronomy here. And in, in, I, I don't want, we don't have time to go into that, fortunately. If you go to this website here, you can, all of this is already programmed, right? So if I, and then I give you another spreadsheet here. So let me first go to this website and uh, show you how that works. So if I go to the website.
so this is uh, uh, the that allow. This is the I guess the little spreadsheet or, or how do you call these applications or applets, right? Uh, applets. So there's a little applet that allows you to calculate what Julian day is particular day, right? So here, if I, for example, look today, January 14, 2014, uh, it's Tuesday, and it's a Julian day number is 2456672. So that means this is how many Julian days elapsed since the beginning, where since that day that we took as a reference, right? 255, 5020, right? I think it's 255. So if you enter any date, like for example, if I'm doing calculations, let me just change it. For uh, Thursday, Thursday is going to be 2456674. That is going to be Julian date. So now, going back to my um, spreadsheet, this just gives us this value here, right? JD. So if I want to kind of go and, and do calculations for a particular date, this is how I'm going to enter the date into that spreadsheet. It's going to give me the JD, and then the rest of it I should be able to copy. So if you look at the next slide in this PowerPoint presentation, it's actually, uh, it has embedded spreadsheet here. And that, uh, that allows you to calculate the, this angle, omega TE, that we need to determine the rotation between the fixed coordinate system and rotating coordinate system. What this spreadsheet would require you is to say, okay, what is the time in, uh, in minutes after midnight for which you want to do calculation. Let's say I want to calculate the position of the satellite now. Now it's, uh, let's say, 5, five o'clock p.m. Now, how many uh, 5 o'clock p.m. here, it's 10 o'clock at UTC, right? It's 10 o'clock in London, Greenwich, right, where I, where I reference. So it's 20, uh, 22 hours, right? So the time would be 22 times 60 to determine the minutes that it elapsed up to a present time, referencing the UTC time, you know, and, and expressing that in minutes, right? So it's 22 times 60 minutes since midnight in London, right, right now. Right? So that's the number that you would enter here. So current time in minutes after last midnight UTC. The second argument here, you would go to that website and determine if I'm calculating for now, what is the Julian day today, right? So you would enter the date and you would plug in the Julian day here. Then it will calculate TC and then it will calculate alpha G and it will calculate omega and omega T in degrees and radians. So this is that omega T that will let us determine the position of these two coordinate systems relative to one another, right? So here example is, I think, let me just go through an example here. This spreadsheet, up, I'm also going to give you Excel that does this calculation. So, uh, and you can go through it and see, check my math, check, the, check if I did the calculations, although I checked it a couple of times. So example here, let's calculate omega t, the angle between these two systems on January 15, 2011 at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So if you look at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, that's, uh, that's, as I just said, that's 22 hours after midnight relative to the Greenwich, uh, Greenwich time. So 22 times 60, I hope some of you have calculated, there should be 1320. Yeah, so that's, the, that's that uh, time. Uh, it's deliberately set as 5 p.m. because that's when I teach the class. <laughs> so I can say it's now, right? So that's that time that elapsed after midnight Greenwich time, right? At 5 p.m. here is 13, 20 minutes after midnight in London. Then I plugged in January 15, 2011, and that ends up being 245-5577 Julian Day. You know, that's how many days elapsed since that reference date that we set in the past. And then what that, what, once you plug in these two numbers, usually if you see it black, it's an input. If you see it in the other color, that's an output, so you don't mess with those fields. It tells me that the, the angle between, between these two coordinate systems is roughly 115, uh, no, roughly 85 degrees. So they're 85 degrees apart. 
so almost 90 degrees apart. So if you look at now from our, uh, what would that be? If I look at where is the, the fixed pointing, it is pointing straight due, uh, due west, right? not through the, through the zero, zero point, but rather through zero minus 90 degrees, right? So it's pointing due west. So that's how you get the rotation between these two angles and then once these two coordinate systems, and that's the only parameter that you need for for this matrix here to do the transformation between uh, the fixed system and uh, and the rotating system. Because you see here the only parameter that is that features is omega E T. Okay. Alright, so Again, uh, reviewing, uh, there is, as I said, the, you need six parameters to specify the position of the satellite in an orbit. Those six parameters are somewhat arbitrary, right? You don't, you, as long as there are six independent quantities that uh, allow you to uniquely choose the, the orbit and, and uniquely choose the, the path of the satellite, it can be, you have different choices. These are the ones that are adopted in your textbook. And I kind of listed, listed them here. Uh, eccentricity, remember, that's the parameter that, uh, that tells, tells, tells us how much the orbit is uh, away from the uh, circle, how much squished it is. The other parameter that we used last time was a semi-major axis. Remember, that's the, that's the uh, half of the axis of the ellipse, the longer axis of the ellipse. The other parameter that we used was the time at the perigee. When does the, uh, the satellite go to the point where it's closest to the Earth? Uh, and then these three parameters I introduced this time, right? The right ascending node, the, the node when the satellite goes through the equatorial plane on its way up towards the north. Inclination is the, the, the angle between the satellite orbital plane and the equatorial plane. An argument of the perigee. Once you go from the from the right ascension, how what is the angle that you need to travel before you reach the perigee? Right. So you know what is the angular distance between the right ascen ascension point and the point where the perigee is on your orbit. So those are the six parameters that your book uses. If you look at the two line element data that I pointed to you earlier, uh, the they don't give you these six parameters. They give you six other parameters, but there's obviously, there needs to be a way how you calculate these guys from these guys back and forth. Some parameters are given, like eccentricity is given in the two line element data. Right ascending node, inclination, and the argument of the perigee are given. Right? So these four parameters you can get straight from the two line element data. What is not given is the semi major x, but what is given is what is called mean motion in re revolutions per day. That tells you how many revolutions per day does the satellite make, right? How many times does it go around the Earth per day? Well, if you know that it makes so many revolutions per day and you know the length of a day, you can determine the period of that orbit, right? How, what is the period, you know, for the satellite? How long does it take for the satellite to orbit the Earth? Once you know the period, uh, and using Kepler's third law, we can relate that period to the semi-major axis. Right? So here, I'll show you how you calculate the period. If you know your mean motion in re revolutions per day, how many revolutions per day you make, then you take the duration of the day, which is 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4.09 seconds. When you divide these two, you get the period in seconds. And then period is related to the semi-major axis through this third Kepler's law. So if I know the period, I can certainly calculate A. So this allows me to transfer this parameter here, mean motions in revolutions per day, into this parameter here, which is the semi-major axis. Right? So knowing one or the other allows me to, you know, if I know one, I can easily calculate the other. The next thing is, what is the time uh, of the passage through perigee. Well, we had this equation even last time. You know, mean anomaly is defined as the new 
times t minus tp, where nu is given as, as this. So once I know what my semi-major axis is, and this mu is that uh, Kepler's constant, it's a, it's a known number, so I can calculate nu easily. If I know mean anomaly, then and I know the present time, I can easily calculate the time where the satellite goes through the patch. Right? So you can go back and forth between these two. You know, uh, so we'll we'll kind of go back back and forth when we need to do it. Any questions here? All right. So let me go through a, an example here, and uh, this is the first time I guess. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, let me hand out to you. Uh, this is the this same example uh, it worked out longhand, so I did it. Uh, I guess manually, and I'll do it on the board again. But you can you can follow, and then uh, I'll discuss the spreadsheet at the very end. Oh. Hope I have enough. I, I give these examples, I actually, you get exactly the idea when I did them. Because <laughs> uh, I was over the time, right? So I did this one preparing for this class in October the last year. Do you all have the, the I don't need it, so just. All right, so if you look at what is the task here, it says, Calculate the rotating coordinates. So I want to do both transformations for the International Space Station at this particular at the time when the, this measurement was taken. What the, as I mentioned earlier, two line element data are measured data. So what the measurements are performed, and then the, the these data are recorded right at that website. Right? So where was this International Space Station when? these measurements were performed, right? And you see here the, the actual two-line element. What I'm going to do is I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I know you have it in your, so we don't need uh, the slides anymore. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll stop the, this guy. Uh, we're going to go through the calculations uh, following this, uh, this particular example. So what is it that we need to determine the position of the, of the cell? We need six values. We need six elements. If you look at this two-line element data, it gives you this. It gives you that your, gives you that your inclination of the orbit, where do we need that? You read that on the second line as the third field, right? You see the second line, the first field is just the number of the line, and then the second field is the, the number of the satellite, and then the third field is an inclination. And inclination in this case is 51.6491 degrees, right? The, the, the unit is degree. Then you give, then you need the right ascension point which you read as, uh, as the next field over, and this is 184.0276 uh, degrees. That's the, that's the field number four. And then you need argument of the perigee, which for some reason is not the, the next field over, but the, the one after that. And it tells me that this angle is 77.223 degrees. Zero degrees. So these are the three position, three angles that tells me the position of the orbit, right? Now to locate the satellite inside the orbit, I need three elements, orbital elements, right? So eccentricity of the orbit is zero point zero 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 two two eight two. Now an interesting thing here, if you look at the eccentricity, it doesn't give you zero point. Right? 
it gives you only the numbers after zero point. Like look at the field number one, one, two, three, four, five. It says zero, 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 two, two, eight, two. You interpret that as zero point, and then zero, 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 two, two, eight, two. Right? This is zero, and the point are absorbed because all of our all of our satellites have either zero eccentricity or something relatively small. It's never larger than one, so there's no to because larger than one, remember they escape. Right? They don't they don't stay around the globe. The next thing you have is your mean anomaly, which is 68.9667. And this we're gonna use to calculate our uh, uh, eccentric anomaly and then and then the position of the satellite in the orbit. And then you have your Mn, which is given in the number of revolutions per per day, and this is 15.49368, and so on. Right? It's a very long number. This number is given uh, given with a great uh, precision. Precision. So these are the six elements that we're going to start uh, that we're going to use in our calculations. What we need to know is at what time I'm doing the calculations. I specify here to do the calculations at the time where these measurements were taken. Well, what was the time where these measurements are taken? This is given in a fourth field on the first line. And it says here the time is given as 13298.2256 and so on. The way you interpret this, these two first numbers, this is year. So I guess the two line element data will be valid in this form until 2099 and then we'll have to do something about it and then this here is a date within that particular year so if you look at here this is uh, I guess uh, 2013 is the year the, the date is October 25th and the uh, time when this was taken is 5 24, uh, 53.7 UTC. All right, so it's taken at 5 uh, in the morning, uh, Universal Central Time, which is how much here? 12. No? It is right after midnight. Right? Because yeah, right, there are five hours ahead of us, so this is around 24, uh, 24 minutes after midnight on the October 25th when these measurements were taken, okay? So that's our time. Now, the calculations of the position of the satellite is divided into two parts. First, we calculate the position of the satellite within the orbit, and then we translate to get this x0, y0, and z0. z0 is zero always, but to get x0 and y0. And once we locate the satellite in the orbit, then we do two times transformation to get it into the rotating coordinate system. So I kind of divide this into part one. When we calculate the satellite in the orbit, and to do that, we follow the approach that we outlined last time, right? You go through the, uh, through the uh, eccentric anomaly, and then we calculate the, the R0 and, then, and phi 0, and then we map R0 and phi 0 into X0 and Y0. So part one, one, is solve for eccentric anomaly. That's that angle E. Uh, to do that, we have equation M is equal to E minus E sine of E, right? Where all of these are expressed in radians. We have to make sure that uh, you remember that. So even though here they're given in degrees, uh, you do all the calculations in radians. So here, m, m is equal to 68.9667 degrees, which is 1.2037 radians. So I have substituting everything here, you get 1.2037 
is equal to E minus 0 0.000 0.00282 times sine of E. And I showed you last time this is the equation, this is what is called transcendental equation. You cannot solve it explicitly, but you solve it numerically in a couple of iterations. And when you do that, you end up with E being 1.2042, right? So this is an eccentric anomaly for this case. So I have this parameter from, from here. I turn it into radians, put the equation, and then solve for E to give me this particular value. Now the second step is I need the semi-major axis of the I need the semi-major axis of the of this orbit. Well, I'm going to do that, determine that indirectly by first determining the period and then calculating the semi-major axis from the from the period and uh, third Kepler's law. I know that a q is equal to mu over four pi squared times t squared. That's a third Kepler's law, which is 3.986 times 10 to the let me see, 14 meter cubed over second squared divided by 4 pi squared and times the period. Well, the period is 23 hours times 3600 seconds in an hour plus 56 minutes times 60 seconds in a minute and plus 4.09 seconds. So this is the period in seconds. I want to have it in seconds because of the way how the Kepler constant is given is in seconds. Divided by the number of revolutions that this thing makes around the Earth. And this is given as this 15, right? So it makes 15 rotations around the globe in a day, right? So from that I can determine the period. So this is divided by 15.49 something divisible, 4, 9, 3, 6, 8. And then the quantity squared, right? And this is in seconds squared. So this second and second squared, and the answer is going to be in meters, right? So you end up this being uh, 3.121953 times 10 to the 20 meters cubed. And then if you take this, the cube root, you get that this is 6783.8 kilometers. So this is the semi-major axis of this, of this orbit. We determine it indirectly by first determining the period, and then relating the period to the <coughs> semi-major axis to the third Kepler's law. Now, that once you know the period, but once you know the semi-major axis, then you can calculate the position of the satellite in the orbit, but using polar coordinates. <coughs> Remember last time we we put the coordinate system uh, x zero, the coordinate, orbital coordinate system, where the uh, zero angle went to the to the perigee, right? And then r was the radius to the position of the satellite, and phi zero was the angle in that in that uh, orbital and orbital coordinate system. So R0 was uh, A1 minus E cosine of eccentric anomaly. In this case, this is 6783.8 uh, times 1 minus 0 0.0002822 times sine of 1.0. 2042. Everything in radians. And when you calculate what is the R, R is equal to 7682.4. And then phi 0 was given as an inverse cosine of A cosine of E minus A E divided by R0. And when you substitute the values, you get that this is 1.204386 radians, which is 69.006221 degrees. So this is the angle 
uh, of the position of the uh, International Space Station relative to its perigee, right? relative to the place where it goes closest to the Earth, you know, but angle measured within the plane that contains the orbit of this International Space Station. So this is phi zero. Once you know R zero and phi zero, you can easily determine x zero and y zero. X zero is equal to R zero cosine phi zero. This is just a mapping between polar and rectangular coordinates. So this gives you six seven eight uh, two point three four times the cosine of this angle here, one point two oh four. 6, and this tells me that uh, this is 2430.21 kilometers, and then y0 is equal r0 sine of phi 0, which is 6782.34 times sine of 1.204.86, and this gives me 638. Two point ninety five kilometers. What is Z zero? Z zero is equal to zero. So that's the position of the satellite relative to the uh, expressed in a in a coordinate system that's attached to the orbit of this of this satellite. Now let's do so. The part one is calculation. Now we know where the satellite is, right? So we need to now go through the coordinate transformation to get its location relative to the different coordinate systems. Go ahead. Okay. In the last class you said um, the phi zero now is not supposed to be a unique value. It is it is not unique value. And, and then when you when you calculate this, you have to actually uh, act, actually verify whether whether this uh, this is because uh, you can have two angles that have the same cosine, right? out of these two angles. Now, this is 69 degrees, right? And you have to compare that against mean and off. Out of the two values that you're going to get here, the one closer to the 60, to the mean anomaly is the one that is correct. Because you can go another 180 and get the same, same cosine but a different angle. And then you look at which one out of these two is the one that is, that is kind of closer to this other. Yeah, very, very good question. Thank you for pointing out. All right, so let's do part two. Now we're doing the transformation. This is transformation. Now first, we calculate M1 of omega, omega, and pi. Remember that really large matrix, right? There is nothing, I'm not going to even try to repeat it here in an in a analytical form. I'm just going to give you what my calculations are giving me so that you can verify that. But uh, that's the matrix that will allow me to map from the uh, orbital coordinate system into geocentric fixed system. Right? That's the transformation matrix. And when I did the, the math here, this is what I obtained, 0.1781. 0 0.9835 minus 0 0.0551 uh, minus 0 0.6192 minus 0 0.0684 0 0.7823 uh, 0 0.7648 0 0.1734 and 0 0.6205. So that's a, that's a transformation matrix that comes from all of these cosines and sines and so on. Make sure, you know, when you verify this, as I mentioned earlier, all of these angles here are given in degrees. You have to transform them. Make sure that you enter, that, that you do calculations properly, that your calculator either uses degrees, which I advise not to do. I advise you to put your calculator in radians and keep it while you're here in school. So that way there's no doubt in your mind what, that if you 
you see a degree, it needs to become a radiant before you do any calculations. So this is the transformation matrix. Now, if you if you so that's the first one we need. We need a second one, the one that is, is a rotational transformation matrix that tells me how much is the is the uh, rotational system rotated relative to the fixed one. In other words, I have to do first calculation of omega t t e and what I call omega m2 of omega e t e, e, that rotational matrix. So the first thing that I need to do is, remember, I need to calculate how many seconds after midnight has passed, right, uh, in, in this case. Now I have, I have uh, the time at this particular time. This is when the measurements were taken. And, and the beauty of this is, I actually already have it in UTC. If I had, if I'm calculating in different time zones, then I would have to take into account the, the time zone difference between UTC and, and the particular time zone. But here, I know that at the point, at the time where I want to calculate the location of the satellite, it is actually five hours, 24 minutes, and 53 seconds after midnight at, uh, at, uh, at the zero UTC at, at, uh, at Greenwich level. So here, the time is therefore equal to five hours times 60 minutes plus 24 minutes, and then plus 553.7 divided by 60, right? So that's, uh, that's uh, time expressing minutes. And this is 324.89 minutes after midnight. Right? So that's the first thing that I need to calculate. The second thing that I need to calculate, what is the Julian date? And as it says here in notes, you can the easiest way to do that is to use this applet here. This is WW. In MATLAB, you actually have a function that calculates Julian date. But uh, there's also this uh, nr.com.julian HTML that gives you another applet in which when you, well, that's the same one, didn't, didn't I just give <laughs> That's the same applet that we went to that will actually, you can enter the date, and it will give you the, the, the Julian date. The date is October 25th at that time. So that gives me the Julian date of 245 So that's a Julian date. And then the, the next thing is I use my spreadsheet where I type in the time. I typed in the Julian day in those two first black fields, and then it gives me the, the angle. So I guess using spreadsheet. Uh, alpha G0 ends up being 33.544 degrees, and then omega E, T, E is 114.99 degrees. Or, um, or uh, you can say alpha e, e, e is equal to 2.007 radians. So that's the angle uh, between these two coordinate systems. Okay? So once I know this angle, then I can calculate m2 of omega e, t, e. That's that rotational matrix. It's yet another, again, one. Uh, three by three matrix, and when I did the calculations, it becomes zero point four two two five zero point nine zero six nine zero zero one zero zero one, and then I have here minus zero point nine zero six nine, and this is minus zero point four two two five. So that's my transformation matrix in M two. So to get to my uh, rotational uh, coordinates, I'm going to delete this part here. Uh, 
my x r, y r, z r is I have to put here m two of uh, omega p, omega e p p with multiplying on m one of capital omega omega p i and times these original parameters that I calculated over there. So I'll just put it 24, 30, plus 4.21, and this is 63, and then zero hit, right? And after some matrix manipulations, you end up minus, oh, actually, let's go here, as, Minus zero point also minus four two four one nine zero nine four minus four four two eight five seven three and then two nine five seven zero zero so this is where the satellite is relative to our rotating coordinate system. So if you go, you have to go on uh, away from the from the zero zero point, right, towards the towards the Pacific Ocean, and then you have to go in the y direction. You have to go away from the east. You have to go west, and then in z direction you have to go 300, 3,000 kilometers north, and that's where it's going to be. So this satellite at this point is somewhere above Pacific, right, in the northern Pacific. Okay, so that's, uh, that's all the calculations. Hopefully you get, uh, I have two notes here. First note is calculation by hands. As you can see, these are some numbers that are of vastly different magnitudes, and, and you know, calculation by hand is not very precise. Nevertheless, you know, I, I want you to go through this once to understand once we when we start talking about it in some other context. Uh, most of the time, these are, in, in practical applications, they're given uh, in some softer packages, right? Where, where you actually go and have double precision and you do all of these calculations with uh, necessary accuracy. One of, uh, usually the way it works is there, all these calculations are done in a, in a part of the package that's called propagator. Uh, one of the most, uh, I guess famous uh, packages that allows us to do satellite planning is called Satellite Toolkit, toolkit SDK. And uh, we have it here at school. I, I use it every now and then. And, uh, and it does all of these calculations with much bigger accuracy than what you can hope to, and much greater speed than what you can do on Python Man. So that's the first note. The second note is for our class here, the last element of the matrix tells you how uh, high the satellite it is from the surface of there. No, 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 no. Here's the here's your goal. This is uh, right. So this point here is what? This is uh, this is the center. So this is the point to which I'm going to put the x x. This is my x rotating. X. What is this point? This is zero latitude, zero longitude, right out of the, of the coast of east coast of Africa, right, right in the in the Atlantic Ocean. This point here is due east, right. This is y uh, r, and this is uh, this is not very good globe, right has to go through the North Pole. Right, so this is your zero. So what is the what is what is it that these coordinates are saying? Well to locate this satellite you have to go four thousand this way in a negative direction. Then you have to go four thousand this way in a negative direction. This gives you a point here and then you have to go you know this many in z direction. So that's why I said this this is this is a satellite. If you think about the globe, this is east coast of Africa, this is on the other side in somewhere in northern Pacific. So 
somewhere around Japan. We can we can do calculations. I'll show you later in, in the course how you determine the look angle, so where to look for the sun. But you understand, it's not about the surface. About the surface, how would you determine how much about the surface is? Well, this uh, this is a radius vector, right? Yeah. So it's magnitude is going to be square root of x r squared plus y r squared plus z r squared, right? So that's how far from this point it's it's, it's going to be from the from the center of the Earth. The radius of the Earth is six seven eight three point fourteen kilometers. So your altitude height is going to be whatever this r is minus the radius of the Earth, right? This is how far above the surface of the Earth. This coordinate tells you how far are you from the equatorial plane due north, right? Okay? So this is the same procedure for Leo and Neo? Same, so it doesn't matter for any satellite. Even right? for Geo? Even for, 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 for Geo, Geo is yeah. in the equator, well, well, so we don't have it simplifies tremendously for Geo, right? For Geo, this becomes zero, right? And if you go all of the transformation matrices become really simple. And then what happens is for GeoSatellite, if you do the math, I'll tell you, I advise you to do it just to uh, uh, get it yourself. But since it's a geosynchronous satellite, that geosynchronous satellite is in equatorial plane, right? So, so there is no inclination and, uh, and there is no ascension, right? It always stays in equatorial plane. It doesn't go up or down. And then what happens is the only angle that you care about is how far it is from from the from the from the Greenwich meridian, right? From the zero, right? So when it comes to geosynchronous satellite, geostationary satellite, all you need to say is one coordinate. Let's say you say it's 70, 73 west, right? And what that means it is seventy-three degrees west of this this thing, which means this direction here, right? it's above the Atlantic Ocean. Was us, right? And that's how all of our right, like TV broadcast satellites and those geosynchronous satellites, geostationary satellites, are located. You just need one, but you know its distance, you know its uh, plane, you know its eccentricity. You still know all of these parameters, except that you know all of them are the same for all the satellites that are on the geostationary. Good question. So let me go back and I'll show you the last. Or well, maybe just just flip to the last page. What uh, what you have here is the spreadsheet that I put together. It's it's going to be posted on the website. Uh, and it's uh, called a uh, very original example uh, two lecture three. So it, okay. Is it coming up? Yeah, it's coming. So, and you have that here. So this spreadsheet allows you to do all of these calculations that I was doing manually. It allows you to do them, you know, in a spreadsheet form. So you enter your TLE data here. You see there is a capital omega. Right, and I assume it's the same parameter. Yeah. So capital omega here, omega here, and then inclination over here, right? So those are the three orbital parameters. And then based on that, it will calculate your M1 matrix here. Right? It calculates each one of these elements individually and then puts them together in a matrix here. Now, um, the, the second thing. Oh, it doesn't give you all of it, right? It assumes that you go to the part one and that you determine these parameters, x0, y0, and z0, right? Just like we did the last time. Now, once it calculates M, M1 matrix, then it allows you to calculate M2. Remember the rotational matrix. The rotational matrix is calculated here, where you would enter the time in minutes after midnight UTC where you would enter your Julian day here, and it will calculate omega te here for you. And then omega te goes back 
and uh, and uh, in this section section here. So here's your omega T in uh, degrees and radians, and then here's your uh, the M2 matrix, and then it calculates M2 times M1 matrix, which is your overall ma mapping, right down here. And then if you give uh, x0, y0, and z0, then it will calculate your xr, yr, and z. So what you need to do is enter the orbital elements, enter the time at which one you want to do the calculations, and then you enter the, the Julian day, and then that allows you to calculate the position of the cell. You can experiment, like this is, this is now set up to allow you to calculate at any given time, right? Uh, this calculates it at 5.24 in the morning. You can say, well, where is this going to be at 7.20 in the morning? And then you can recalculate the time, punch it in, and it will give you the new coordinate and so on. Right? Or you can say, well, where is it going to be on a different date, right? And you give it a different date and calculate the Julian day and different time and it will give you the position. One thing about two line element data is because of all of these secondary effects, we're going to discuss them in the second lecture, uh, they are valid for only a certain period of time. Right? After a certain period of time, the satellite drifts because we are neglecting all of these secondary gravitational pulls from the sun, from the moon, from, from the uh, uh, imperfections of the Earth. So uh, the TLE data are updated all the time. Right? So if you cannot go and say, OK, this was collected on October 25th. Let me see where is it going to be 10 years from today. Because over 10 years, you accumulate quite a bit of error. But uh, what you can do is you can go to that website that I showed you and get the TLE data that is closest to the time for which you want to do the calculations. And then your calculations are going to be reasonable again. OK? That's it for today. Look for all of these at the, at the website.